Let me begin now. Let me begin by introducing my guest, Samuel Klumpenhauer. He's going to be joining me and Gary, our other esteemed part of the Apocryphal Apocalypse. David Savaris is unable to join us, but he does send his regards. We're thrilled to be with you because this is a topic we've talked about before, Gloss Ordinaria, but you are the man, Samuel. Indeed, you just came out with this incredible book, The Glossa on Genesis from Emmaus, uh, in a masterful compilation, beautiful, just wonderful. And, um, well, you're the man. You're the scholar in the Glossa. You're the one whose brain we're going to pick today. <laughs> but before we even begin picking it, I do want to ask you, uh, brothers, how are you doing today? Gary, how are you, my friend? And Samuel, how are you doing? How are you all doing today? Doing very well. Glad to be here. Yeah. yeah. Thrilled to be with you. So the audience, if they're here, um, we're glad they are watching this. When they're watching it, they know who we are. Samuel, my friend, maybe you could talk a little bit about yourself. Uh, I know you just filmed a show for me over in my channel, the Apo uh, Patristic Pillars. This is a channel where we primarily deal with the canon due to our canonical issues. So for the audience tuning in here, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself. And, uh, you know, what uh, what prompted you to come out with this incredible Beautiful edition of the Glossa. Maybe you could talk about yourself a little bit, my friend. So my name is Samuel Klampenauer, Canadian originally by birth, and I live in Texas now uh, as a teacher, but grew up and, and was trained as an academic in Canada. Um, I was It was through the University of Toronto that I, where I completed my, my master's and my PhD focused on, on medieval studies, and, and I was trained there uh, to work with um, medieval manuscripts and, and how to edit texts and, and ultimately how to translate texts. That that prepared me uh, with the knowledge and skills necessary to work with medieval texts. And it was also there that um, I had a number of friends working on the Glossa Ordinaria. I'd never heard of this text until I got to graduate school, even though I studied theology um, a fair bit as an undergraduate student. But I'd never heard of this text before I got to uh, to graduate school. And but when I did hear about it, I heard about how important it was in the Middle Ages. It, it was, if you will, we can add some nuance to these categories later on, but it was the standard, if you will, commentary on the Bible in the Middle Ages, compiled in the 12th century and, and especially in the 12th and 13th century of immense popularity and influence. If you read Thomas Aquinas, you'll you'll get thousands of citations. And so many people in the 12th and 13th century, when they're reading the Bible, they're reading it with this commentary, this Bible commentary. And it's, written, and it's laid out in a, in a beautiful fashion. The, the copies will have the biblical text written in the middle, the uh, Jerome's Vulgate. And between the lines, there'll be these little glosses, these little comments, these little notes about the text. And then in the margins, you'll find these excerpts from the church fathers. And so as you're reading through the Bible, you're reading through the Bible in unity with, with tradition, with the church fathers, with those authorities. The text has its origins. It's um, rather a mysterious text in its origins, but it's we don't even know who, who compiled all the different books. We know generally who was involved, and, and generally it was a number of scholars teaching the Bible in France in, in the 12th century, late 11th, 12th century, and some of Lone in, in particular, and, and people who were associated with him. And so this text began as a record, an approved record um, of teaching the Bible. Later on, it became more of a reference work, more of a, a commentary, Bible commentary in the sense that we now think of it, but it has its origins in the classroom. And so these are notes these glosses are, are, which means tongue, these glosses are uh, preserving for us what the teachers were saying in in these early classrooms in France, you know, at the start of the, right before the birth of the universities. Gary, any particular thoughts, brother? Yeah, no, I appreciate that line of work. And I thought I detected a Canadian accent <laughs> you know, when we were talking before the show. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that's confirmed. Uh, yeah, great stuff. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't have any questions right now, but uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say about the gloss. Yeah, and particularly because I, uh, you know, we've talked about the gloss over the years, Gary and myself, as we geek out. But uh, to this particular extent, at this level, is, uh, is another level. We really greatly appreciate you um, sharing your knowledge with us. So let me ask you this. Now, you came out with this incredible volume already. 
It's beautiful, beautiful text. By the, by the time this airs, there'll be a link down there. People can snag a copy. Great job from Emmaus. Uh, they do incredible work. Uh, this is a great gloss mm-hmm. on, on the book of Genesis. Um, you talked about how the glosses, you know, you're going to find a good amount of early fathers in there, Augustine, Jerome, and what have you. Now, a little very quick side question. Would you say that Thomas Aquinas Catena Area, as we know, his golden chain of commentary on sacred scripture, on the Gospels, would you say it was very much inspired from this in any particular way? Is that possible to say? It's possible to say um, it it was certainly a source that he used, and, and in fact, he cites okay. the gloss. If you read through the the Catena, yeah. you'll often see him cite the gloss. And even when he's not citing the gloss, when he's citing Augustine or Bede, um, often he he knew about. He would have read those works originally, but often those excerpts that he's giving you from Augustine and Bede are the same excerpts that you find in the gloss. So he he certainly had the gloss at hand and knew it very well. Um, that said, he. Um, in, in the 150 years or so between the gloss and, and Thomas uh, is also the, the introduction of a lot of the Greek fathers into the Latin West. So the gloss itself is mostly restricted to to the Latin fathers or Greek fathers who um, like origin of which there were Latin translations available. Uh, so when you get to the Catena, he's, he's drawing from a wider array of church fathers, Chrysostom and so on that you don't find in the gloss. Um, but yes, there's this continuity. So he certainly had the gloss itself, but also in both the gloss and in Thomas's work is, is this method at the heart of, of the medieval universities of scholasticism, namely that uh, th- this, these disputations, these disputed questions. That, so there's a question about how to interpret the Bible and the church fathers seem to not agree on it. So you're going to have authorities on one side of the question and you'll have authorities on the other side of the question. And you as a teacher are, are presenting these authorities to the students and, and hopefully by analyzing the different authorities, you can come uh, to some kind of harmonious resolution. Um, maybe that might, that might mean siding with one against the other, or it might mean okay, wait a minute, they were talking in this sense and they were talking in that sense. And so in the gloss, you get this, um, and not solely, um, but you'll, you'll find throughout the gloss, there'll be these disputed questions and they'll give you authorities on one side or another about how to answer it. You know, So um, the creation of the world, did it happen um, through six 24-hour days did, or did it happen, did God create everything instantaneously as Augustine held? And you'll get, you'll get authorities on both sides. And so again, this is a classroom text, and it's inviting you to have these discussions and debates in the classroom. And and again, if we fast forward to to Thomas, uh, somewhat in the Catena, more explicitly in the Summa, you you have the same method. There, there's a disputed question, and he's going to give you authorities on each side or another. Unlike the gloss, Thomas will be very explicit in his resolution. Oh. The gloss sometimes you get a resolution like that. Sometimes um, it's left open, and we presume that in the classroom. Uh, there would have been talk and and hopefully a, a resolution in in some form or another, but certainly they're they're and they're both scholastic. The gloss is at, at the early end of this kind of method, and and Thomas is is when it's well developed. But they're certainly part of that same medieval approach to scripture that we find in in the medieval schools. If I could jump in, William, definitely. I, you mentioned the gloss a couple of times. Is there a single? a uh, gloss that is the standardized version or are there several different <laughs> kinds of glosses so th- this uh, this um method of teaching scripture and method of recording say a master's lectures uh, of glossing uh, in in the 12th century there are many different glosses so th- which is these sets of notes these sets of excerpts there are, there are many different versions of them over time, a particular set of notes and excerpts becomes standard. And so we eventually end up with a glossa ordinaria, a, a standard set of these notes. Uh, but yes, there are many different glosses. And, and if you go, not just in theology, if, if you study uh, the law faculties, the medieval law faculties, canon law and civil law, they also are glossing the text in, in this. So they have their own, on canon law, there's a different glossa ordinaria, a different standard set of notes that everyone studied with. Um, and so in the Middle Ages, they just called the gloss. To call it the glossa ordinaria was, is late medieval, I think late 13th or 14th centuries when they start saying, this is the, the set of notes we want to do. 
Um, but yes, there, there are many different glosses. Uh, nowadays, for the Glossa Ordinaria, for this set of notes that became standard over time, most people um, use uh, the, the first printed edition by Rusch in 1480. That's kind of the go-to text that most scholars will use nowadays, uh, which is giving you a, a particular um, set of notes uh, among many, but it was it, it is the set of notes that became standard and and is basically for the most part, what Thomas would have been reading when when uh, he had the gloss at hand. Okay. Very, very good. Very, very good there. Now, one particular uh, point that I do want to touch upon that we, we spoke about, and you helped me, you helped outline particular points to dialogue about, is that you very often will hear in Protestant apologetic circles the gloss uh, utilized to to go against the deuterocanonical text, to attack the deuterocanon, if you will, um, and to say that look, the gloss um, is proof that the early church did not utilize the deuterocanonical text the way Catholics do today, and this gloss at the particular time in the media, medieval era is proof that it's carried on into that era, era as well. And as you outlined, one particular point that is made very often by various individuals who knows where it originates from, <laughs> but the claim will be that the gloss was the official biblical commentary used during the middle ages and that it represents the overall view of the church as a whole. Can you talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So go going back to our conversation about how the gloss came about um, and in, in many ways, the mystery of the gloss, uh, should should uh, key us into something. Name of that officials officials a, a misleading word. There, there was no mandate from the Pope or even from the bishops to compile the commentary. So it, it and there was and subsequently there was never a, an official mandate approving the commentary either. And so officials probably not the best word for for what we're dealing with. The standard is is fine. Um, it was certainly the, a popular text. And in fact, the most popular text of the 12th century and very popular in the 13th century, in the 14th and 15th, um, it, it declining in popularity and, and sort of supplanted by other commentaries. Um, Nicholas of Lear's commentary in the Bible uh, started to outshine and, and was easier to use. If, if people get the book, they'll see how strange the text is. And um, so eventually people wanted something a bit more user friendly. So I, I, I wouldn't, uh, official is not a good word to use to describe it. Uh, second, it's not, the gloss is not a catechism. It's, you can't just go to the gloss and find out what the church believes on this or that point. The gloss is a book used to help teach people how to read the scriptures. And so just like in, in, in a classroom, um, it, if, if you have a good professor, it might be a little difficult to know exactly what your professor believes because your professor is presenting you with, with two sides of this or that issue. And, and maybe he'll reveal, sometimes he'll reveal his own position, sometimes he won't. And so too in the gloss, we're being presented with different readings of scriptures. Sometimes it's, it's clear that this or that reading is, is to be the one. Uh, other times it's not clear and, and the students are invited to debate it and so it's very difficult to just pick up the gloss and and figure out what it said, uh, because again, it has its origins as a classroom text. It, it wasn't originally a, a reference text, a catechism, or an authoritative commentary like we might um, think of today. Gary, any, anything you want to maybe add to that, or any particular question? Yeah, um, I'm curious about the introductory material. Um, both at you know the beginning of the Glossia Ordinaria and also the uh, the individual books, I noticed looking at different editions that the, the introductions differ. So I take it that's not part of the original. This is later, or mm -hmm. is that uh, too complex uh, that answer? <laughs> complex. So I can. Yeah. I'll, I'll split that up between the individual books and the and the overall preface to the entire work. In the individual books, what you're often getting is what you would get um, with many just Bibles without commentary, namely the, the prologues to Jerome. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's very little. Um, so often when people say the gloss says in the introduction to Maccabees or, or this or that, what they really mean is uh, Jerome's prologue. 
Um, there's not really much more um, given than that. Um, I do notice that they often say uh, online, they'll often say in, in the prefaces to Judith or so on, um, that there's this statement that it's not in the canon. That's a that's a bit misleading. The, the statement is that it's not in the Hebrew canon. And so right. the, the implication that it's not in the church's canon is that's not explicitly stated. It says it's not in the Hebrew canon. And, you know, which is which is true. Uh, yeah. in that sense. And so it's it's less it's it's more benign comment than we might say. So certainly they were talking about these issues of canon, um, but it's it's not the gloss isn't making an explicit statement on the church's canon. Um, and now there is this so you you know one way or the other, you're not going to get an explicit statement on that. Uh, you can try to infer from you know where they're where they're paying attention to, you know, which books they gloss or which books they don't gloss. Maybe you, you can make some inferences about what the masters in these early schools thought about that, but it's it's pretty difficult to, to take any kind of explicit um, statement from the gloss like that. Uh, if I, to your other point about the gloss to the overall work, and that's the one I see online quoted often, um, th th this long preface, this tract on canonical and non-canonical books, and that's what I see quoted uh, over and over again online. And so I did some digging about that. And uh, I, I'm, if I may, I'll talk at length about <laughs> my detective Definitely. work about all that. Definitely. So it, if you go, if you look to the citations to that, you'll find a citation to to first of all to Ming's Patrologia Latina, Volume One Thirteen. And so you can these texts that I'm about to talk about are all available online. So yes, you can you can look that up, uh, volume one thirteen, and you go down and you see this tract from about canonical and non canonical books, which states pretty explicitly which are canonical and which are not um, cited in the Protestant favor. That's um, that's why this keeps coming up. In in Ming's edition, you'll you'll see a citation. Ming is saying he he took this prologue from the sixteen seventeen Douay edition. And so, yes, you can go find the 1617 Douay edition, and uh, you'll, you'll find it there. In both Ming and the Douay, they have a footnote um, about the Council of Trent, but uh, the tract itself is given in its entirety. And then um, you can track this down further in, in the footnotes by some of these authors. You'll see not just the reference to Ming's edition, 1852, you'll see a reference to uh, um, an early edition of the gloss in Basel, 1498. So, okay, you can take it another step back to 1498, and you can see the tract there um, without, Trent had, of course, had not yet happened yet, so it's just the tract without the footnotes about the Council of Trent in the 1498. Okay. So I, I'm looking at all this, um, and here's the thing about all these um, printed printed editions about the gloss. The gloss is a medieval work, but it had sort of the second life in, in the modern age and was reprinted about a dozen times in uh, uh, from 1480 to 1852. Over 400 years, there's about a dozen different editions. And if you if you Google online, you're going to come up with one of these editions. It's... it's it, it, um, what can I say? These these editions are not giving you just the gloss, and explicitly so. They're normally giving you the gloss with um, another commentary of Nicholas of Lyra or with um, uh, other editions. And if you read the prologues, they're, they're explicit about this. You know, they're drawn from Greek fathers, adding to it, and so on and so forth. So in these modern editions, often you're getting much more than the gloss itself. You're getting the gloss plus a number of other things. There is one edition that scholars like to use because it doesn't have all these added things. It, it gives you basically just um, the medieval gloss without all of this added stuff, these other commentaries or so on. And that's the first printed edition from 1480 by Rusch in uh, Strasbourg. And this is the standard. Uh, if you're really into the gloss, you'll, you'll go to the manuscripts. But for most people, this is the standard Latin edition that you're going to go and reference to find out what the gloss says on this or that, because he's giving you, Rouches, the, the editor, the printer, is giving you the gloss without any of these other commentaries. Okay, so I went to Rouche to 1480, and that tract on canonical and non-canonical books is not in Rouche. It, it's him. He does not have it. Okay, I so somewhere somewhere wow. between Rouche and 1498 edition, we, we have this edition of 
of this tract. And indeed, I went to some of the medieval manuscripts and it's not in the manuscripts either. Uh, where it does come from is the first time it appears is in the 1495 edition printed in Venice. And uh, if you go to that edition, it'll clear up a lot because unlike in, in the 1498 edition, it's left, in, there's no um, author attributed to that tract on canonical and non-canonical books, but in the 1495 edition, they actually tell you who the author was. And uh, uh, Bernard Dolus, uh, Godolus, uh, a prior of um, uh, in Venice and lived in the late 1400s. He, he was involved in the printing of that, editing and printing of that Venice edition. And, and indeed, if you, if you scroll down in that 1495 edition, if you, that's on page three or so, that tract, if you scroll down to about page 20, you'll see a line, the Glossa Ordinaria begins. So in other words, the, the printer is not trying to um, make you think this was original to the gloss. The printer is, is explicit that these are added prefaces in the same way that if you republish a book nowadays, you'll often add uh, a couple um, additions to the start, you know, about the translator or the re-edition and so on and so forth. And the same thing's going on here. And so th that tract is not part of the, the medieval gloss. Uh, it's not even from the Middle Ages. And so, I mean, to, to throw wow. the weight of, of the medieval gloss behind that tract is, um, is just not true. Interesting. That is mind-blowing. I never knew that, Gary. Did you, did you have any idea about that at all? No, no, not at all. Um, but I did notice that it was missing from the earlier edition, mm -hmm. but I didn't, I, you know, I just figured publishers weren't uniform and maybe that was just a nod one out, you know, or, but uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because uh, that explains later editions and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's unusual that a publisher will <laughs> actually like write a text and then put it, you know, at the beginning right. of another work. But like you said, though, and I missed that point, is that, uh, or maybe I didn't even look at that particular edition, is that the publisher does note that this is not part of the original gloss. So, um, yeah, that's very interesting. That changes things. So, A lot. so, like, Thomas Aquinas wouldn't, when he used the gloss, he wouldn't have had that track. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. No, he wouldn't have had that track. I mean, certainly the track tells us that they were talking about these kind of issues, um, mm -hmm. but the gloss itself is not, is not uh, again, that's not part of the gloss. And so there was certainly a discussion, you could say, from the gloss happening about these issues, but it's not taking a clear side. Uh, as I was working, the beautiful thing about Genesis is, as I was working about through Genesis, um, and I mentioned about these disputed questions that... Uh, that you're going to learn in the Middle Ages, and it's beautiful as you work through Genesis because scattered through it, the whole work, you'll have um, this debate in a way. The gloss, in a way, is preserving these debates because um, they believe they're helpful, and and it's this debate between uh, Jerome and Augustine, not so much on the canon, but on the value of of the Greek of the Septuagint text versus the the Hebrew text. And the glosses, as you go through Genesis, the glosses give you this kind of back and forth between the two drawn from their letters or from their works about the value of these things. Because uh, the, the debate is not simply about the canon. It's also a debate about um, certain renderings of, of the text. Um, in the book of Jonah, for instance, was Jonah under an, yeah. uh, I might get this backwards, but was he under an ivy tree, uh, um, an ivy uh, as in the... <laughs> Uh, Hebrew text, or was he under a gourd, under as a, as according to the Septuagint, and so you know th there's this uh, different readings, um, but that's being presented to you in the gloss, and and in a way they um, they want to talk about these things. They're not trying to hide from them, and and they believe that they're fruitful debates to have. And... That 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 is fantastic. That really really is good, and it really does fill in in my mind at least. Uh, multiple gaps that were there uh, when dealing with the glossa. Uh, I know Gary, I know Gary's done a, a good amount more research than I have on it, but it definitely does fill in some gaps there. So another thing that I've noticed, um, and I noticed it uh, massively in part, and I'm trying to see my notes here. Yeah, massively in part to uh, Gary pointed it out when we spoke a little bit over a year ago, I believe, or maybe less than a year ago. 
about um, you even have multiple uh, parts, for instance, where the glossa notifies us of Augustine, where a, there are positive utilizations of the Deuterocanon canon as well. Uh, I don't know if you looked at that at all. Uh, maybe you can uh, talk about that briefly. So it really isn't um, utilizing the gloss in the way uh, certain individuals do, uh, kind of a, as an axe to grind against the Deuterocanon, really doesn't work in their favor at all. I think as we've uh, as we've seen, and maybe you could talk about that because the gloss doesn't um, the gloss that doesn't hammer hammer against the Deuterocanon the way uh, modern day Protestants attempt to make it seem like it does. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. That's right. And again, this um, the gloss, of course, is written before the Reformation, and and so it's not written. It's not always answering the questions that we're asking, or it's not answering them in the way that we would like it to ask, simply because those were not the same questions uh, that they had about the text. So certainly they're talking about these these issues of canons and, and of, of the canonicity. Their, their categories might be a little different than how we define those things. And, and they're um, having those kind of conversations, uh, but it, it's not definitive. And, it, and that's the thing about scholasticism. A lot of people think that, you know, um, Thomas Aquinas and the Summa or in other works, you know, when they, when they bring up these disputed questions that their main focus is just to resolve it somehow and move on. Um, but that's, that's not really what's going on. I mean, they, they've, um, sometimes they call for a resolution and, and I think in the church eventually they did call for a resolution by the time we get to Trent, but we're, we're living in, we're talking about the world long before then right now. Um, uh, certainly many of these debates were, were seen as a, a way to get to know something deeper. And if, if too much controversy arose, then maybe we have to settle them. But the church is not quick in, in all kinds of theology. The church is not looking to quickly uh, uh, to talk more than it needs to or to settle more than it needs to. And so they're having these conversations. And, and I think in terms of the gloss, that's about all we can say about it. Um, certainly, th what the gloss does tell us as well is is what were they teaching in in these early universities, and these masters of the sacred page, these teachers of the Bible, and and um, the fact that uh, books like Judith, for instance, are glossed means that they were being taught uh, in this period. Um, now, um, th th again, that's not a hard um, argument for canonicity because right. they were teaching some other things the, the prayer of manasseh for instance is glossed also um and so that um it's, you, you can't jump from that straight to they, they right. the canonical in our sense but in, in any case they were they were teaching these books and and so on and so forth they weren't avoiding it like the plague though <laughs> which is a good um a good that's, point that's you bring up sure. yeah 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 and, and as, as regards to other books um I think some of these other books that we today as Catholics wouldn't call canonical, if you will, I think we can still find value in utilizing a number of them um, for historical purposes or to really look at the way many early fathers utilized them. Because as we know, a number of those books that didn't make it into the canon as early as Hippo, Carthage, Rome in the, early, in the, in the late 4th century – we're still utilized in a positive sense by multiple fathers. So I think the gloss really does um, reflect that a number of these books were still being utilized. And I guess, could we say in an ecclesiastical sense, in the sense of they have edifying information uh, within them, would, would that be would that be proper to say? Would you, would you say, Samuel? Uh, I'm not opposed to that. Right. <laughs> again, right. again, it, it's it's their, cat, their categories of canonicity and what's in the mm -hmm. canon are... are um, not they're not exactly the same as, as how we think of it. Um, it. There's a lot of overlap, but I'm, sa I'm not saying these are completely different things. Um, sure. Uh, but certainly they're using these words a little different than we are. And, and they're not as concerned uh, because, again, this is all happening before the, the Reformation. They're not yeah. as concerned about speaking um, decisively uh, about these things. Gary, any particular thoughts or any questions? Um. Yeah, I was um, actually I did have a question. Then as soon as you mentioned my name, I, it totally <laughs> slipped my mind. Um, can you tell a little bit about how dependent is the gloss on uh, Jerome's Latin Vulgate? Uh, mm. Because I know what the I'm going to butcher the name, the Complutensian Polyglot. Uh, 
I think got that, right. kind of, that kind of ma maps onto the, the standard ball get of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, as you mentioned before, uh, the gloss utilizes a lot of Jerome's prefaces um, in the work. Is, is there any other evidence of dependency on the on the ball get, or is it more independent of the ball get? It, it, it's giving you basically a um, a common version of the Vulgate. Yes, yeah, so so it, okay. it's heavily dependent. It, it, I mean, it's it is Jerome's Vulgate, or um, there are of course some textual variations that that creep into that over time. Um, but in any case, it is giving you Jerome's Vulgate and uh, attached attached to that to also his prefaces to to the various books and the, so they utilize a lot of jerome but i also noticed that it utilizes other uh prefaces from other saints and later medieval doctors uh yes uh um i was just looking at what was i looking at maccabees and there's a preface mm -hmm. there by rabanus yeah uh, right now I, now I haven't in the in the printed editions anyways i haven't gone to check in the medieval manuscripts whether those were there or not um but certainly at least in the in the first printed edition yeah there, there are other prefaces being used also and you mentioned nicholas of lira was also influential at least as far as introductory material later on later on uh, oh. so the, the gloss is, is um i forget nicholas's years late 13th century so the gloss is written um more than 100 years before Nicholas. Uh, what happens later on, as I mentioned, the gloss is the, the peak of its uh, popularity and influences in the 12th and 13th century. Into the 14th and 15th century, it, it's waning. People know about it, but they're not making um, uh, the, the use of it that they used to, and, and, they're, um, uh, and they're choosing often instead Nicholas of Lyra, uh, just because he's more... Um, He's more systematic about things. He's more uh, comprehensive. Uh, the gloss, again, is more of a manual to teach you how to read the Bible. It's not comprehensive. And so there are many verses, for instance, if you look through um, my translation of Genesis in certain chapters, there's very little material there. And so if you have questions about those couple, those chapters, you're not going to get much from the gloss because, again, it's not meant to be a comprehensive commentary on the Bible. It's, it's about the amount of material that you would get in a lecture course because that's that's what it was um so if we jump to these printers uh these early printers not rouge he does just the gloss but but printers following him uh, they know that the gloss it doesn't answer all the questions that people have about the bible and so um they want they want to give not just the gloss they want to <coughs> give something else as, as well so they make the choice to often print the gloss along with uh, the commentary of Nicholas of Lyra, even though historically they're distinct works. Very, very um, good point there. Were you going to say something else, Gary? No, no, go ahead. Um, you you brought up uh, Ravenous Maurus. I was butcher. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, I, I believe he was locally venerated. I don't think we have him on the calendar of, uh, of uh, being universally venerated, but either which way, um, if I'm correct, didn't wasn't he pretty popular for a commentary or a, a very extensive and co extensive commentary notes, if you will, on the Book of Sirach? Is that him, uh, or did, do you know that off the top of your head? I don't know it off the top of my head for sure, okay. but but he was famous for for his commentaries on the Bible, and he was he was uh, prolific in his commentaries. So um, gotcha. I haven't worked with Sirach, but I would certainly not be surprised to see his commentaries there. Certainly with Genesis, with Matthew, um, with Exodus. I mean, he is he prominent in those, in those. That's okay. right. And and so this work of reading through the church fathers and excerpting them and copying those excerpts into, into the margins of the gloss, sometimes there's, it's a one-step process, you know, that the people in, in the 12th century or late 11th century are reading Augustine directly and copying from his works, but th they certainly um, made use of previous uh, collections of the church fathers and, and are using, so in other words, some of that work had already been done of, of reading through the church fathers and, and excerpting, and most importantly, are, are the commentaries of Urbanus, which were used by these compilers in the Middle Ages. Wow. Very, 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 very interesting point. Let me let me pick your brain on one thing, and I wonder if you you'd be able to answer it. And if not, that, no, perfectly fine. I I heard it stated, read it. I don't know if it's any true. 
that later on in history, not included in the original, um, in any of the original glosses, that they uh, you find multiple Greek fathers interpolated. Is there any truth to that? Into the gloss? Yeah. Is there any truth to that? That's right. So the Dewey oh, there, edition, okay. mm -hmm. the Dewey edition of 1617. If if you have that edition, you can find it online. Yes, you'll you'll find not just the the excerpts from the Latin fathers. You'll you'll find that those editors added in many more excerpts from from the church fathers. So wow. um, yes, the sixteen seventeen Douay edition uh, has, is an expanded gloss with those Greek fathers. Wow. Okay. So there is a little, little bit of truth to that. And and one figure that I know uh, you, you spoke about <clears throat> was quite influential in the. In the Latin father's eyes, in terms of his commentaries, Origen he does uh, he does feature very often in the glossa, uh, if I'm correct, right? Uh, like I'm guessing because of how uh, how well respected his commentaries were in the eyes of various Latin fathers, Saint Jerome being one, um, he does feature quite often, doesn't he? Yeah, depending on the book, uh, in in okay. Genesis. In Genesis, he's not ever quoted directly. Now, if, if you track down what Augustine is talking about or what Jerome is talking about mm -hmm. on certain issues, um, what, what they're saying is often from Origen. Uh, but Origen's, and his homilies by, on Genesis, by the way, were known in the Middle Ages. So um, they did have access to some of his works on Genesis in the Middle Ages through Latin. So he's not cited directly in Genesis in exodus though all the time his homilies on exodus are, are are foundational to the gloss on exodus and so this is the other thing about working with the gloss is that again there was no official version there were uh, mm -hmm. each of these books were glossed over over decades of teaching <laughs> by different individuals and so each each of the books of the gloss has its own textual history its own person glossing or persons um involved in glossing and editing and um, again it's hard to know exactly how this text came about but each book has its own history and its own set of sources that it's using oh. gary any particular uh questions or anything to add um no uh, well and now i don't remember if you mentioned this at the beginning of this show or was it before we went off camera but uh, the influence of the Glossio Arnaria, that was mainly in the Latin West. It, did it have any influence in the East? Not that I know of. I, I haven't looked too much into that, but uh, not that I know of. Certainly this method of teaching is, is not um, singular to the gloss, and certainly there are, um, it's related to to the Catena tradition, which is a very similar thing. You, you're not surrounding the Bible text with commentary like or interlinear commentary between the lines. It's just kind of a running commentary like Thomas Aquinas. And certainly they were using these kind of methods in um, in the East. But in terms of the Gloss Ordinary and its influence in the East, I, I haven't really come across that ever. But again, I'm, I'm no expert on, on what was happening over there. Yeah, that it would make sense that it'd be mostly uh, the Latin West because I mean it's in Latin, it's uh, mm -hmm. used in Latin schools, um, and I think that's important too. So it's not a picture of the overall church; it's, it's more of a focus on what's going on in the universities uh, in the West, not necessarily reflecting the church as a whole. That's right. There's no there's no Greek translation, um, and it's in some ways the first. It's at it's at it's part of the story of, of how the universities came about. In some ways, it's the first textbook. Well, I guess you could say the Bible is the first textbook, but um, apart from that, it's in some ways the first textbook used at the University of Paris. Not so much in an official sense, but in, in a practical sense by the early masters there. Uh, but yes, it, it its influence is, is um, from from what I read and understand limited to the Latin world. Okay. So um, th let's talk a little bit about the project for Emmaus Road Press. So you just published the uh, the Genesis gloss, and uh, and what's that based on? Is that based on the fourteen? That's uh, right. So it's based on th there is no critical Latin edition of the text, and mm -hmm. there's not likely to be one because of the amount of um, <laughs> effort that we take, both for the length and for the amount of manuscripts yeah. involved, right. and also as we were talking about the especially in the early 
in the early years of the text, the fluidity of the text before it became ordinaria, before there was a standard kind of version of it. Uh, so um, there are many hurdles to to making an edition, a critical edition, um, or many critical editions for these different versions. But in any case, there's no critical edition. So uh, yes, I, I use what what most scholars use, uh, namely the first printed edition from 1480. I re I have recourse to to um, the manuscripts were needed to correct that sometimes, but for the most part, what you're getting there is the edition that um, uh, Rush gave gave us in 1480. Yeah. Now, which also, I, by the way, was the was the version. All these subsequent printed editions are using Rush's text. That they're not going back and copying a, from manuscripts. They're they're giving you Rush's text plus these other things we've been talking about. Okay. Yeah. Now I haven't seen uh, your work. So do you gloss the gloss? Do you have footnotes explaining, you know, <laughs> things within the text? Um, I somewhat, uh, it, yes. If you go to the end notes, sometimes I'll give you explanations about obscure passages. More so, the end notes are to track down the sources. So, if you're interested in knowing where particular glosses came from, sometimes the gloss will tell you that Augustine Bede, so on. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll say Augustine Bede, but it's really something else. Um, so, in the end notes, I, I track down the sources of, of most all of them and explain a few things here and there but uh, mostly i'm just giving you the sources yeah that's that threw me off when i was looking at maccabee's prefaces mm -hmm. because and sometimes it's not so clear it seems like it comes from jerome and i've actually seen people cite it as coming from jerome mm. uh, where he makes some positive comments about maccabee <clears throat> but uh, i think that's from roberto's mm, okay uh, yeah 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 yeah, interesting. And, and so, some, sometimes, by the way, those sources are not from the medieval manuscripts. Sometimes those were added by later people who who were making similar efforts to me. And sometimes their efforts at tracking down things may not have been accurate. Again, some of those attributions are in the medieval manuscripts, but but not all of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, William. No, Gary, to piggyback off of your comment, uh, and I'm glad I found the note. I'd written it down. And to piggyback off of that comment on and the Maccabees, uh, and to really just back up what uh, Samuel said earlier, uh, noting how some of these prefaces, when you read them, particularly the Maccabees, tells you the books of the Maccabees, although they are not included in the Hebrew canon, very interestingly, you read that it tells you, are nevertheless annotated by the church among the divine volumes. Just to add that so we can have that. I think that's pretty significant. So that's important. You don't very often hear that brought up in, in dialogues um, in regards to the canon, but I think uh, Samuel brought up a fantastic point <clears throat> in that we are not dealing with any of the debates that would arise at Trent. This is written beforehand. Uh, you don't have a, a Martin Luther, uh, you know, <laughs> so we're not dealing with any of the uh, claims that would uh, arise at Trent where Trent had to come and reaffirm the status of the Deuterocanonical text. So with that being said, uh, you can expect to find certain things uh, in Jerome that uh, Trent very clearly went against. Um, and things like this that uh, about the Maccabees that tells you that are they are nevertheless annotated by the church among the divine volumes. I think that's pretty significant. Wouldn't you agree? To note that point. Oh, me, me, or, me or Gary. Yeah, you. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, Samuel. Apologize. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I was just looking at that. Um, I haven't tracked down to see if that, again, we've, this whole discussion of prefaces and, and yeah. which are in the printed editions, which are in the manuscripts, I haven't looked to see. I, I was just looking at that preface because in Rush, they give you the preface of Jerome, then they give you that preface, and then they give you oh. another preface of Rabanus. And again, I haven't looked at the medieval manuscripts to see if they're all there. Um, but certainly in, insofar as... Um, the printed editions go, yeah, they, they, uh, 1480 that we're talking about here. Um, I don't know which one you were looking at, but in any case, again, it's this question of not in the canon versus, as some of these people are saying, yeah. versus not in the Hebrew canon, uh, which is a very different thing. It's, it's not a clear statement about, um, about the church's canon. Yeah, that's a really good point because if this is a, a discussion within the university, they don't have to express everything explicitly in the text because. You know, in the university, it may have been common that whenever you say it's not in the canon, it's not in the Hebrew canon or the rabbinic canon. So they don't necessarily have to stipulate every time 
you know, the cannon issue comes up because that was just part of the air that they breathe, you know. That's right. And and so this text is very it's not like um Thomas Assuma that you can that you know he wrote in, in the way we imagine people writing books, you know, sitting down. Um this this text is very much tied to to the oral teaching of the schools. And yes, so it, it's not exhaustive, it's not meant to be exhaustive, it's not meant to record everything. Um we can say they were they were talking about these issues. Uh, that's fair to say, but what exactly to say much more than that is very difficult because again, this is these are incomplete records of of what people were saying in the classroom. That's a very good point that you bring up there, Gary. If um, if utilizing the term canon in that way was pr pretty much the standard way of using it. I think the best thing to do would be then to go and look how the church was utilizing those books. For instance, we have uh, Origen noting uh, when dialoguing about the canon, noting that the Hebrews hold to different books and those in the church and the very same in, a, in, in, in Athanasius, St. Athanasius, in the way he utilizes the term canon in the 39th Festal Letter, a very different way than we would utilize the term today in the modern days. So I think that's a really, really, really good point. I guess my final question would be, and then before we allow Samuel to put in any plug, um, Samuel, I know you did say that more volumes are being worked on. God willing, mm. we're going to be praying for that project. If, if more volumes are being worked on, is is there a possibility in the future of one of them being a deuterocanonical text? Is there a plan to do all of the the glossa? Or what, what, uh, what is going on over there in Emmaus? I know you have the, the inside track on that. Uh, I, I personally I have a desire to translate all of all of the gloss, and so all of the books that were glossed. Yeah, um, that's a that's a ten year project. That's a project that'll take a lot of effort and and a lot of funding. Yeah. Um, but anyways, that's my dream is to do the whole thing. Yes, I'm working right now. There, there's some other people working with me. Um, some excellent excellent scholars um, working on this also. I'm working with someone and nearly done the gloss on on Matthew that'll be coming out soon, and then I hope to return and uh, resume my work on the Pentateuch. And a couple other guys are working um, on some books of the New Testament also. So there, there's other works in uh, coming up, and we'll see we'll see if we can continue and, and get this whole thing done. Yeah, yeah. no, well, that's an enormous project. Yeah. <laughs> Humongous. You said ten year project, and I, I think you're right around the 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 mark there. At least ten years, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know that um, we know very well that writing books and in, including books that are massive like this and incredibly important books, um, they don't uh, line anybody's pockets with money. <laughs> so <laughs> we need people um, in every way possible uh, to support your work to go over, head over there to Emmaus and snag a copy, first off, of the Gloss Ordinaria that you did in Genesis to let Emmaus know, hey, people want more editions. And how do you let a company know that? Well, you go and you buy, you start buying them. And one thing that I would really like to, before I, I allow you to uh, plug in anything you may be working on your webpage or anything, I want to tell people, look, Mother's Day is coming up, and we know there's <laughs> some female theologians out there, or people that really love stuff. Mother's Day gift, or hey, look, I know one thing. Father's Day is coming up very soon. Um, I know one thing. I would love to wake up Father's Day morning and have one of these as a gift. So for your for your man in your life that is a theologian or a nerd, a theology geek, apologetics geek, they need to get a copy of this. Beautifully done incredibly incredibly i'm geeking out and i am of course bragging because uh, i have a copy and gary doesn't have one yet i gotta <laughs> i gotta brag I gotta brag a little bit but i know he'll be getting his copy very soon brother you've been incredibly incredibly helpful for us today you've been great your time we greatly appreciate it we'd like to give you as long as you'd like to put a plug in you want to point the audience to a web page anything else you may be working on in academia.edu the floor is yours right now, brother. Plug anything in you'd like to plug in. Well, I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure uh, being on the show and meeting y'all. Um, 
Yes, I, I want to just thank Emmaus. They've been great to work with and very supportive of the project. And um, um, in the publishing world, it was um, that's rare because these books, again, are not financially um, profitable. And so um, I've been blessed by God to be able to work with someone who, who kind of shares my vision for this work. Um, if you want to find out a bit about more, a bit more about me, you can you can go to my website, samuelklumpenauer.com, and I've written various articles on on the Bible, on academic popular articles. And if if you want to read some more about what I'm up to, you can you can head over there. Incredible, incredible, Gary. Any any final thoughts you'd like to uh, to share with us? No, I, you know I would like to echo what you said, William. Uh, it's important, especially if you're in a Bible study, if you um, are just love scripture, um, or maybe, you know, a great gift for a priest, even if uh, maybe oh, yeah. you're not. Uh, this would be, I think, wonderful homiletic <laughs> material on Genesis. Yep. Um, but you're right. I mean, sales is important and because this is a, you know, a niche, but it's a, it's a really neat, we really need this niche because I know with my bad Latin trying to work through the manuscripts, it's tough. You know, the, the, the fonts are hard to read. It's hard to decipher what's being said. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just so nice to have that in English where you don't really have to, weed, you know, wade yourself through the weeds to understand what's going on in the gloss. Uh, because the, the parts that I've read from the gloss is wonderful. And so that'd be awesome if we could do the whole uh, yeah, thing. but if, if memory serves me correctly, isn't the Ming like uh, two or three volumes? Uh, yes, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and Roosh, the, the edition I use is four volumes, and yeah, and because again, Ming is not giving you all of all, all of what you would find in medieval manuscript, and so right. yes, it's the the volume on Genesis is maybe three four percent of of the entire work. Yeah. Oh wow, goodness, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, no, no doubt. And uh, one parting thing that I would note is uh, Gary's right. Uh, you need to support this. The best way to get more volumes out is to support uh, whenever they're putting out material like this. And I'll tell you one thing. If you go to a Bible study, any particular Bible study, and you walk in with this massive book <laughs> of Genesis, I'll tell you one thing, you, you own the room. You're the boss. <laughs> you own that room. You're the boss. Get a copy of it. Tell you one thing. It is big. It is hefty. And it looks wonderful in your theological bookshelf. Samuel, I want to thank you very much for your time, for devoting time today to be able to talk about this passion project of yours and to share your incredible wisdom with us. I know for a fact our dear brother who wasn't able to be here, David, Dr. David Sabars. Uh, we'll love looking back and being incredibly jealous that he wasn't able to join us. Uh, but for sure in the future, we're definitely going to have to bring you back. I want to thank you again for joining us, my friend. We'll be praying for you, praying for all of your work. We look forward to having you on again, my friend. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, And happy Easter, everybody. Yes. You all take care and God bless.